All this is Dr. Mobeen Sayed from drbeen.com. Welcome to one more show. I hope the audio is working okay. Today I got myself into a problem. I was trying to reset the studio with some new equipment. I wanted to have a mic over here. But anyways, in that process I actually messed up and the camera and everything is all over the place. So I hope it is okay. Uh, I also had to create long haulers protocol update for uh, FLCCC. I couldn't do that either. I just saw Dr. <laughs> Merrick's uh, email there that where is the protocol. So after this discussion, I'm going to work on that protocol. So with this little chit chat, let's start our discussion. So there are many cool beans who were going through COVID. So Paul, Skyfrog, John, I think Texas. Texas, how are you? Was this COVID or something else? And Kelly and family. So everyone, my prayers with you. I believe Paul is Paul and family are doing better. So hope everyone stays safe and recovers fine. So let's start. So references for the talk today, this is drbean.com. This is the paper. This is actually one person case, but it has a very important message in it. This case report is from the doctors from Sheffield Hospital, UK. So uh, the Department of Gastroenterology and Hepatology. This, these are some reference links here, the structure of, a, of the liver, this is what is the AST, ALT, we probably all of us know. Then this is what is the function of the liver function tests. Then various kind of hepatitis that we'll see today. And what do they mean? That is here. This is another um, definition of a hepatitis. Then this is the empiriopolysis, which we'll talk about. And then liver acidness. So these are the references. These are present in the links as well. So with this, let's start. And I am going to continue to struggle with OBS, so don't mind. Now, where is my... All right. So once again, I hope you can hear me. And as you can tell, my picture is gone because I messed up. So please just tell me that my audio is there. Okay, sound is fine. Thank you. <laughs> All right, so now let's start our discussion. So immune mediated hepatitis, that is the important part. This is a similar thing as we've been seeing immune mediated thrombocytopenia or immune mediated uh, heart inflammation, cardiac inflammation. This is immune mediated hepatitis, although rare. Only seven cases have been seen in UK so far out of all the Moderna doses given. Actually, not all the Moderna. There were four Moderna, three Pfizer. So uh, not a very prevalent disease. However, the author's point is that because it is not very prevalent, if we do not, if you're not aware of how this happens and what happens, then the second dose can really be dangerous. And this case report that I'm going to discuss is where the person actually got the second dose. Even when he told the vaccine center that, hey, I had hepatitis last time from the vaccine. They still gave him the next dose and he once again developed liver damage. Fortunately, he recovered and that is the basic discussion. So the summary is that there is a, for the first time, the authors claim that this report provides conclusive evidence that vaccine-induced immune-mediated hepatitis is possible and is seen. This is important. They're saying this is the conclusive evidence. And, and I can actually, when you read it, you would see that after the first dose, there is hepatitis, and then the patient recovers. Then he gets the second dose, and the hepatitis develops again. So it is related to the vaccine. So what are the details? So this is it. So we stop here. I want to quickly provide the summary. The summary is that messenger RNA-based vaccines can cause autoimmune hepatitis or liver damage 
and steroids are very useful in helping. Number one, number two, the vaccine center uh, staff should know that if a person developed jaundice or liver function problems previously, then it is possible that they might develop even severe case of hepatitis with the second dose and they should be careful. So this person, now we are going into the detail. If you just wanted the summary, we're done. Detail. 47-year young man, because I'm also in this range now, I call this young, not old, previously healthy, got their first dose of Moderna vaccine on 26th April 2021. A labs soon after. So what happened was he developed jaundice and became malaise and became tired. So they did labs and what they found was that serum bilirubin was increased. And what happened is that because liver's function is to take care of the breaking RBCs and bilirubin, and majority of that will be processed in the liver and it will be sent to GIT from where it is excreted or passed out with fecal matter. Very tiny amount goes through the urine. So when the serum, when the bilirubin levels start increasing in the blood, or serum, that means liver is leaking. Liver cells are leaking bilirubin. They're not able to send it to bile. Instead, it is leaking out of them in the blood. That means the cells are damaged. So this person had increased serum bilirubin level. 190 micromole, where normal is between, micromole per liter, where normal is between 0 to 20. That was lots of damage. Then ALT, the liver enzymes, and maybe someday we should talk about liver and its functions and enzymes. ALT rose to increase, this is a liver enzyme, to 1,048 units per liter. Normal is 10 to 49. And if you, uh, while you're looking at this test, if you look at the right side, where I have written raised IgG, Immunoglobulin G levels were increased, immunoglobulin M levels were increased, so there was definitely an autoimmune component in here. So ALP was increased as well. Normal is 30 to 130, and this patient had 229. Albumin levels 41, almost in the normal range. And what were we going to expect from the liver, which is damaged? A liver, the liver main makes a lot of uh, proteins in our body. So when the liver is damaged, the proteins formation becomes disrupted. Anyways, in this stage, albumin was normal. Other than that, everything else was fine. Blood counts were normal, renal functions were normal, international ratios were normal, LFTs four years ago were done on this patient and these were normal. No use of prestamol, which could have caused liver damage. No alcohol intake, which could have caused acute liver damage. Nothing significant in ultrasound for CT thorax or abdomen or pelvis or MRI pancreas, meaning there was no malignancy, there was no other inflammation, there was no other cause. Similarly, they did the profile for the other viruses as well, and they found none. So all other reasons that liver damage could be occurring were ruled out. And then, of course, as they saw, that the IgG levels and IgM levels were increased, which means that there was autoimmune component or immune-mediated component. And what happened? So remember this. This is 30th April. By 25th June, so April, May, June, so that was 30th April, so May and half of, almost whole of June, two, two months. By 25th June, the patient's serum bilirubin level was kind of returning back towards normal. Their ALT was also returning back. So remember, this is still higher. So liver is still recovering. Imagine giving another dose at this level, at this stage. Right, so that, that is the point of the authors. So let me just very quickly actually read that so we can understand that why did they make sure 
that this discussion was done. So give me one quick second. So if we go to the end of their paper and discussion, they say over here, number one, treatment with corticosteroid therapy appears to be favorable. Number two, we wish to highlight that immune-mediated reactions from SARS-CoV-2 messenger RNA vaccines are very rare, and during the COVID pandemic, the vaccination program continues to be crucial. This is their standard. They have to, I guess, write it so that nobody says this is an anti-vaccine paper. We report this case to encourage vigilance for drug-induced reactions to raise awareness to vaccination centers to incorporate it into their routine checks. This is important that the vaccination centers should be able to ask that, hey, did you have any chest pains? Um, did you have any jaundice or tiredness or fatigue or other things? So in the routine checks before administering the second dose, long-term follow-up of identical individuals will be essential in determining the prognosis of this immune-mediated liver injury. So with this, let's go back to the discussion. So the jaundice started fading. So remember, this is two months now. The patient is still kind of improving. And then guess what? Goes back for the second dose and gets the second dose. So 6th July 2021, goes for the second dose, reports that, hey, last time I had jaundice, still gets the second dose. And guess what? Develops even a severe form of hepatitis. So a few days later, these labs are from 20th July. So a few days later, the patient starts feeling bad again and starts developing jaundice again. So he goes back for the workup and they do labs on 20th July. Jaundice had returned. Serum bilirubin level starts increasing again more than last time now. So that means the damage. The, the liver was poor. Liver was already in trouble. And now you hammered it once more. So bilirubin level increased. ELT level increased even more than last time. And then prothrombin time increased as well. Normally 11 to 13 seconds. It went to 18.4. So liver damage was occurring and liver functions were reducing. So the patient was then put on steroids and referred to these authors department. So that was the Department of Gastroenterology and Hepatology, Sheffield Teaching Hospital, UK. So there what they did was they did the liver biopsy and they looked at the damage, plus they continued the patient on prednisolone, 40 milligram per day for two weeks, and the patient became okay, was discharged and went home and continued to recover. So let's look at the damage that they saw. So I'm once again going to go back to, let's <laughs> go back to myself and then let's go here. All right, so let's look at the damage. Here. So they had done a biopsy on examination of the patient. He was alert, deeply jaundiced, with hepat hepatomegaly. That is, the liver was palpable. It was big. So when you do the liver check, you can see the border of the liver growing has grown and you can see it below the normal level but no ascites so not enough damage that the water started to accumulate in the abdominal cavity that was not there repeat abdominal ultrasound showed a mildly fatty liver patent portal and hepatic vein veins flow with no ascites so kind of a better news Review of the liver biopsy showed acute active hepatitis. So liver cells were getting damaged, acutely damaged. Widespread areas of bridging necrosis. 
So what happens is that liver is made up of very tiny, small units, functional units. Bridging necrosis is that when one unit becomes necrosis, necrosis means tissue da damage to the point of the cellular death. Fortunately, liver is a very decently regenerative organ. It can develop cells very quickly as long as the basement membranes are intact. So the cells were now dying. These were being necrosed. And when the multiple SNI or multiple functional units, imagine every unit being a house in liver. When multiple units are burnt together, then they start fusing with each other. These SNI kind of merge with each other because they're damaged together. And so there is no more boundaries between them. That is called bridging necrosis. It bridges multiple SNIs. Marked interface hepatitis. Interface is, let me see if I can have a picture, and I hope they don't. So interfaces are where there is a, um, where there is a boundary between the bile and the blood system or the liver tissue and the blood system or just these areas which are at the interfaces as the name says so there was interfaces and hepatitis there so that means around the blood vascular system the cells that were sitting around the blood vessels were more inflamed and damaged why because antibodies were circulating in the blood and from there, when they would come out of the blood, they would attack whatever are the cells nearby. So the cells that are sitting at the interface, these will get damaged first. So they are saying that we saw marked interface hepatitis, lymphoplasmatic infiltration, inflammation, including eosinophils. So this is interesting. The white blood cells or inflammatory system cells started coming over to have a war and eosinophils were there. Ballooned hepatocytes. Ballooned hepatocyte mean a hepatocyte that has become so much damaged or is under attack and it starts swelling because the water is accumulating in it or its own function when it is functioning and the enzymes and those things are accumulating, it starts ballooning up. So ballooned hepatocytes, multinucleated giant cells. We have seen this before as well. Giant cell is actually when multiple cells that are sitting next to each other, they become fused. Remember for the COVID, we say that in the respiratory area, in the lower lungs, the COVID or the Delta especially, Omicron seems to be not able to do that. Delta used to be able to cause fusion of the cilia of the cells and that would cause cells to start fusing and they, they would make giant cells. Similarly for the healthcare workers over here or professionals or students, you know that macrophages, when they are present and they are trying to wall off an area of inflammation, they would fuse deliberately with each other to make giant cells which would have multinucleated, multi which will be multinucleated because there are multiple cells that fuse together. So that is what they were seeing here. And empiripolysis. Empiripolysis is when one cell is found inside the other cell. Just like in our human um, life, a mom who is pregnant has a baby in her. Similarly, there are cells that have eaten other cells. And so they have the other cell, the whole cell is present in them. What is the example? Macrophages. When macrophage will eat up another damaged cell, they would have a cell in them. Then they would digest that and break it up and, and throw it away. So this process is, or this observation, is called empiripolysis. So they were seeing empiripolysis. That means macrophages and genetic cells were there. They were killing the liver cells that were attacked by the antibodies. And those little liver cells were ending up inside the macrophages. There was minimal fibrosis, so that is a good news. Usually what happens is wherever there is inflammation, the result of the inflammation is either restoration of the original tissue, and there are many conditions for the original tissue to be restored. Many times it cannot be. Liver is very, very regenerative, but 
if the damage is persistent or damage is too devastating or the basement membranes, you can say the foundation of the tissue or the organ, those foundations are broken, then the cell cannot be put together or cannot be put on top of those foundations or basement membranes, then the scar would occur. That area would become fibrosed. So this, there was minimal fibrosis. That means, number one, this damage was acute. That was short. It just occurred, the damage. And number two, the response to damage was not that bad yet to fibrosis to occur. So that was good. Ishak stage one, that was the damage um, and the fibrosis level. The pattern of injury on histology was consistent with acute hepatitis with features of autoimmune hepatitis or possible drug-induced liver injury. And there are many drugs that can induce liver injuries like parastamols and tylenols and alcohol and so on, poisons, triggering an autoimmune-like hepatitis. So extensive damage to liver. Fortunately, the patient was given prednisolone. So this is the important, the whole tox takeaway is just this much. Prednisolone, 40 milligram per day for two weeks, helped the patient recover. And this is why I want to quickly now go back here for a second. This is why I keep saying steroids are important for the inflammation. I know that there are so many exotic uh, medicines that various doctors um, promote. They want to use them. They feel that steroids should not be used. I see so many doctors afraid of or kind of conserve, conservative about using steroids. Steroids should be used first to reduce the inflammation. Then you see where the pathology is and start fixing that pathology instead of not using steroids. Steroids function is to reduce inflammation. I saw somebody's comment that, well, if you give the steroid, then that becomes immunosuppressed. And that is why we should get the modulators. That is a, not the most accurate way of stating the use of steroid. Steroids are not in small doses. They're not just the immunosuppressor all the time. They are very, very important immune controlling system. And when we are talking about immune dysregulation, where there is an autoimmune attack of, on the system, that means immune system is more active than normal. That means giving steroids would bring it back towards balance, not just take it to immunosuppression. So that is the takeaway. The takeaway is not to say, let's just be afraid and let's just be upset. Instead, management, 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 and that is with the prednisolin here. So that is a discussion for today. Now, I have to um, beg leave from the chit chat. I have to work on the long hauler. So that is also a steroid discussion that I'm going to do. I have to work on the long hauler to update that protocol and send it to Dr. Paul Merrick and uh, other folks this evening. So if you are okay, I'm going to skip the chit chat, work on the long hauler protocol to update it. To give you a quick preview, the first line, in my opinion, is going to be uh, steroids plus IVM plus low dose naltrexone. And then the IVM will be tapered off or removed. Then the Steroid and low-dose naltrexone continue for about two months. Afterwards, they both can be reduced and removed. If needed, there may be a need for fluoxamine. There may be a need for statins. And I am not yet fully sold on Moraviroc, but there may be a need for Moraviroc at some point. So that is the protocol I'm going to update and send it to FLCCC. You now have a preview to that as well. So thank you very much. Stay safe, happy, and healthy. If you like these discussions, um, you can, number one, like, subscribe, and share. And number two, there are links in the description. You can buy me a coffee, or you can use PayPal, or you can be a patron. Thank you. I'll see you tomorrow.